Hi, I'm Larry Claypool. For about 45 years, I worked on Corvairs on a daily basis. And today, I'm going to show you some of the things that we learned about Corvair Power Glides in all that time. Uh, this series was part of the Corsa uh, meetup where uh, we would zoom in a meeting for Corsa members to uh, give them some added value to their membership, see, see what's uh, the inner workings of cars and uh, specifics to the Corvairs. So this is an extension of that. And uh, a lot of people had asked for uh, some technical sessions. So here we are delving into uh, the power glide. So this is the, the basic setup on the Corvair power glide that you have if you have a power glide equipped car. This part is the transmission. It's an aluminum case. This one's nice and dirty, just like you'd see uh, on a typical used car. This part, the cast iron part, is the differential. Okay, it is separate from the transmission. And at the very front, we have the torque converter, which is a, an essential working part of the transmission. They are separated uh, due to the differential being in the middle, but there are a total of uh, uh, two shafts that run from the torque converter to the transmission to uh, transmit the, the power and fluid back and forth. We'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, first, I wanted to give you the actual layout. Now, I'm gonna separate these and take off the torque converter. I'm going to pull off the differential after I move the governor out of the way. So this brings us down to the basic automatic transmission. So with that, because when you work on an automatic transmission, I can pretty much guarantee if the transmission has three quarts of fluid in it, four quarts will end up on your garage floor, on your sleeves, and your arms, everywhere else. So. Uh, let's put on some gloves here so we don't get too nasty. Now I will tell you, <clears throat> this is not going to be a session on how to overhaul a transmission. And it's not a session on how to remove it or reinstall it from the car. What we want to talk about here is common problems of the core rear automatic. How to identify which transmission you have because I know a lot of you might have some extra spare parts laying around and you got three transmissions there. How do you tell which one is which? Are they all the same? Does it matter? We're going to try and explain all that. But you really need, if you're getting into any kind of uh, work on your Corvair at all, there's three things you got to have. If you're a novice and really don't know much about Corvairs, one of them is the Corvair Basics book. This was published by the late Bob Helt. He was our technical editor for Corsa for many years, uh, a brilliant guy. And this is a, uh, a great book on overall views of the Corvair. It tells you about them, uh, gives you a basic rundown. It's a basic book. It is not a repair manual. But if you really didn't know much about anything on a Corvair, uh, this is all divided into sections. Here's our uh, power glide section that you might refer to today and gives you a nice overview of it. And uh, if you really didn't know much about what you're working on, this is a great first place to start. And this is available uh, directly from Corsa. The second thing you gotta have, if you, uh, you're uh, think I'm gonna fix this, is the shop manual. Uh, there's a couple different manuals. There's one for every year. The main books, are the 60, the 61, and the 65. You gotta have one of those three, depending upon which year your car you have. If you have a, uh, let's say a 66 Corvair, you'd wanna get the main book like this and the 66 supplement. The supplement only covers the changes on the 66 model from the basic 65 book. So this is the Bible. You gotta start with, with a factory information. And then lastly, we have the Corvair Tech Guide. Uh, there's now four volumes of it available. These are all the technical tips that were published in the Corsa Communiques for the last several decades. And uh, you know, the factory shop manual is a great starting place. This is the second part that you need to have because it's all the combined experience of everybody that uh, wrote a good technical article in Corsa. So, uh, that, those are our important reference manuals, and we, in fact, are going to refer to those today in some of the workings of uh, our tech session here. So the first thing that we want to do is to identify a transmission. 
you got a bunch of transmissions laying around or you buy one off of uh, uh, the communique for sale list or Facebook or Craigslist or wherever you find it and the guy says yeah it came out of a Corvair um, and you say what year and the guy says I don't know yeah, so how do you know what do you got well <clears throat> there's a couple things you can look at to first identify it we'll start with the basic Corvair car power glide the front uh, pump cover looks like this you'll see two bosses here these round circles if those are drilled for an eighth inch pipe fitting and have a, a, a brass fitting coming out of here for an inverted flare fitting that means that transmission came from a Corvair truck okay there is no real difference except this cover is drilled for the fittings and the pump which is the next piece inside here uh, has a pressure regulator valve in it uh, for the oil cooler the Corvair truck automatic had an oil cooler as standard equipment and uh, Otherwise the transmission is the same for a given year, but if you do find one that has got these two holes uh, Two bosses drilled out and tapped and it, they may even have the fitting still in them uh, that identifies it as having uh, originally been set up for a Corvair truck the next thing is the throttle valve lever this is the lever your accelerator linkage connects to this the bottom part here goes forward towards the front of the car eventually ends up at the gas pedal the top part connects a rod about three feet long that goes from here up to the carburetor cross shaft every time you step on the gas pedal this moves uh, and not only is it simply a pivot point for the linkage it also moves a valve inside the transmission you can hear tap as I move that that's starting to move the valve and the last half inch or so is an extra spring tension on here Ex extra st stiff spring and that's your detent so when you're going along about 30 miles an hour you want to pass somebody floor the gas pedal when you floor the pedal you'll feel an extra half inch or so of gas pedal travel it's much harder to push the pedal down that's on purpose uh, You've heard some of the, the term, you kick it down. Well, when you floor it, you can feel that extra spring tension. You get into that spring tension, it changes the pressure in the transmission, and it forces the transmission to go back into first gear for extra power to pass. So that's the, the kick down. But these levers are not the same on all years. Let me get you a couple of samples. There's actually four different levers but for our purpose today, I'm just going to show you three of them. The 19, this is the style that's used basically from 61 to 64. In 1960, the lever looks identical, except it does not have this U shape where it's folded over. It's simply a flat lever. What they did is they had a clip on here, a snap clip, just like you have on your accelerator linkage on a 1960 model. But they found with the small amount of contact here in the throttle rod, it made the throttle rod kind of wobbly. So what they did started in 61, they folded over the top of it so that the rod had to go in two places. It kept the rod much more stable. And then they used a little E-clip on the outside to retain it. So this style is used on 61 to 64. And you can see the size of the hole in here where the accelerator linkage bushing goes. That's what this transmission has. The type of bushing that is used in here originally is a uh, kind of solid looking rubber bushing. These are readily available from Clark's. In 65, the lever looks exactly the same except the hole is bigger. There's not a lot of difference here, but you can see that the hole is a larger diameter on the 65 style uh, lever. This style is used in 65 and 66. The bushing it used has these uh, little serrations around the inside. You can readily tell that that's different than the early style bushing. If you try to put the early bushing in here, it just falls right through. So the hole size is different. And again, this style bushing is uh, the 65 and later style. Otherwise, the lever is the same. In 67, 
They completely redesigned the, the lever. They made it a big L shape. There's no mistaking it. Now it uses the same size bushing as that 65 and 66 piece, but the shape is totally different. So with these three, and keeping in mind the variation of the 1960 lever, you can get a good idea of what you're looking at. Now, could this have been changed? Of course it can. If people are not careful when they're servicing the transmission, say I was working on this, sliding around on the bench and the lever was in the down position, I slid this thing over, catch it on here, I could bend it. If you're not careful taking the transmission out of the car, people drop stuff, people break stuff. This could have been changed. That's not a, uh, an end identifier, but it's a good first step because it's on the outside. You can get a pretty good idea of it. The next thing you want to look at is the vent on top of the transmission. This is just a little metal cap here. It's just crimped over, and that's the air vent to let the transmission vent. This style vent is used on 1960 through 1966. In 67, Chevrolet went to a, uh, I would call it a less expensive type of vent, but it was also used on a number of GM cars. It's a little plastic vent. So instead of this crimped over metal piece, there's simply a hole here in the front of the transmission and this plastic piece just slides into it. So you would actually see that amount of it sticking out. Uh, so if you see a transmission with the plastic vent or a hole where the vent should be, that's a pretty good indicator it's a 67 or newer transmission. Inside the transmission, now you would have to have the pan off for our next identification, and that's going to be the valve body. A more positive identification of the power glide is once the pan is off, and that is our valve body assembly here. Okay, first indicator that you might have a earlier transmission is that the filter screen is screwed on. A later transmission valve body. It has the casting here, but it is neither drilled or tapped. So the filter screen is just held on by the O-ring. It just snaps in place, no screw. The other identifier is that on the valve body separator plate here, between the transmission halves, is the steel plate. On the 60 to 63 transmission, this surface, now remember, this is on the driver's side where your throttle lever is at, is just completely flat. On a 64 or later transmission, you see this notch cut into that, that piece right here. And that's the indicator that this is a 1964 or newer valve body. What's the difference? The difference is that because we now have a 164 cubic inch engine on 64 and later cars, it has higher torque available from the engine than the 60 to 63 145 cubic inch. So in order to help retain that torque and properly uh, match the transmission capability, the valve body is redesigned for different valve body pressures inside here. The 64 and later transmissions operate at a higher uh, internal pressures so that the bands and the clutches are applied with greater force to uh, properly match the torque that the engine makes. So could you use <clears throat> a transmission from a 64 and later uh, Corvair in your 60 to 63 car with a 145 inch engine? Yes, it'll fit, it'll work fine. Could you use an earlier transmission? Now, obviously we've identified this one as having the 61 to 63 uh, uh, lever and also the 60 to 63 valve body here with the screw on filter and it doesn't have the notch. So this is from a 145 engine. If we had this transmission, could we put it in, say, our 65 convertible with a 110? Sure, it will physically fit. It will bolt right up and it'll work fine. But does it have the torque capacity that the 64 and later does? Mm, no. Will it work? Yes, it depends how you're driving the car. If this is just a driver and you, you drive the car pretty lightly, it'd probably be just fine. But uh, if you run the car pretty hard, you may find that uh, the 
transmission uh, would slip under certain conditions. Uh, full throttle upshifts, uh, full throttle standing starts. Uh, it may not be able to hold the torque capacity of the higher horsepower engine. So uh, that will help be an identifier for you is these three things is the lever, the type of vent it has, and the valve body is a pretty distinctive way to uh, tell what ear transmission you have. There's one other point in identifying a transmission because there is one specialty transmission. Now besides the forward control, which we talked about earlier with the cooler fitment on it, the 65 to 69 models with the 140 horsepower transmission have two special features on them. One is the governor and the other is the valve body for the 140. What's the difference? The governor itself, this is our governor, and what it does, it's driven by the differential, so it's related to road speed. As it spins around, it causes the weights inside of here to move out and move this valve inside here. So it's one of the two things that determines at which point the transmission shifts, at what speed it shifts at. So with the uh, 140 automatic engine, uh, Chevrolet decided to be beneficial if it had a higher wide open throttle shift point at a higher RPM than the standard Corvair does uh, for better performance. So the way they identified that is they used some paint marking on the end of the governor. This particular one is orange. I've also seen kind of a, a light purple ha having been used, either the purple or the, uh, the orange paint on there. And they would also mark the outside of the governor can itself with a, just a blotch of the orange paint. Now this one's a typical Midwest governor and the paint's well, well worn and uh, gone off of here. But it stayed on really well on the internal parts of the transmission. So you can tell the 140 automatic governor by the, uh, the orange blotch on there. Now if they simply did the governor alone, the transmission would always have a higher shifting speed, uh, which is not necessarily desirable. If you're just, just easing along in traffic, the normal shift point on the Corvair, the very minimum shift point, is typically between 14 and 16 miles an hour from low to drive. With the 140 governor, if you only put the governor in, you would have a higher shift point than that. So you'd be you know, just creeping along in traffic at say 20 miles an hour and you don't need to be because you're just creeping along and the transmission would still be in low. So what they did is they revalved the valve body in here so that at low speeds, low throttle opening, the shift point remains at that low number, you know, 14 to 16 miles an hour under low throttle conditions, but at wide open throttle, when you got your foot on the floor, it'll have the higher shift speed. And you can identify the 140 automatic valve body by that blotch of the orange paint. Again, the paint holds up really well on the valve body. So uh, one quick look at the valve body that it's got a blotch of the orange paint here and orange here. Remember, it could be light purple as well. Uh, those are the two internal differences on the 140 automatic. The amount of uh, torque capacity is exactly the same. There's no difference on that, but uh, the wide open throttle upshift is different. The transmission as an assembly is also identified by a blotch of orange uh, or the pink paint on the outside of the transmission case. Now this one we know is not a 140 automatic, but if it was, it would have a blotch similar to our valve body just up on the top area here. Uh, it's not in a particular you know, exact location, but somewhere it would be readily visible uh, on a transmission that is fairly well preserved. In other words, it's uh, not terribly rusty. Uh, you would see that blotch. And let's get our friend the torque converter here. Our torque converter is also identified as a 140 automatic in two places. Again, 
the inside of it, we can see right on the top, let me get a little pointer here, right on top of the one member in here, we can see the orange paint inside there that identifies that as from a 140. Okay, the other way we'd identify 140 automatic is on the torque converter, this is the engine side of the converter, there's a blotch of the color paint on the outer rim of the converter here. Now this you can barely see, it would be much brighter like it is on the valve body if this was well preserved, but it's not. It's a typical Midwest converter that's been laying around in high miles. But you can see the remnants of it out here, uh, that this was originally from a 140 automatic. Now I know your next question is, well, if these parts are different for the 140 automatic, what's different about the torque converter? As far as I can tell, there is no difference mechanically speaking. Uh, I've looked through the parts manuals uh, during the actual years of the Corvair production. So like in my 66 parts manual, there is no difference noted for the 140 automatic converter as it is for any other converter. Next thing I want to talk about is common problems that you're going to find with the automatic. I mean, really, these are really pretty good transmissions. Uh, people make fun of them, oh, you only got a two-speed transmission that's so archaic. But you know what? These things worked really good. They were an economy transmission, but they were very reliable. Uh, another great thing is they made enough of these that parts are really pretty easy to come by on these. You know, they made 1.8 million Corvairs. I'd say at least half, uh, maybe a little more than half, was equipped with the automatic. And they made them over a period of 10 years. So, you know, a million of these transmissions got made and a lot of Corvairs uh, were out there a long time so that the uh, parts are not too hard to come by. If you looked at, say, our, our uh, corporate cousins of the Corvair, like the F85 and the Buick Special, those transmissions were only made for three years and only fit one or the other car. The Olds and the Buick both used different transmissions. The number of those transmissions made, very small, hard to find parts for. But in our case, pretty easy. Most common problem that I hear and worked on at the shop was leaks, leaking transmissions. And especially when the car sits a long period of time, say more than two weeks without being run. You come into the garage and you look, oh my God, there's a river of transmission fluid running out from underneath the car. It's like, oh, I need a transmission overhaul. No, you don't. Don't get too excited about this. Transmissions leak. Why do they leak? Let's quickly slide our transmission back together here. We're going to put our differential in its normal place next to the... At the front, I'm going to pull the governor out just a little bit so I can get this on here. Okay, and on the front, is our torque converter. So when the car has been running, the oil pump inside the transmission, pump up front here has run oil through that skinny shaft in the, in the, in the middle of it, it's hollow, and filled up the torque converter all the way with transmission fluid. That's normal. After the car has been parked without running, gravity is pretty reliable, and eventually the transmission fluid that was filled up in here begins to drain back through the hollow shafts into the transmission. And if you look from the top of here to the middle, which would be the bottom of the shaft, that's a pretty big area. So way more than the quart, probably close to two quarts of transmission fluid in half that converter. And now, where did it go? Well, it went into the oil pan, and it has now overfilled the transmission. If you pulled out the dipstick on your car after it sat parked for a month, assuming there were no leaks or it leaked out, you would find that you're overfilled by a couple inches on the dipstick. So now, things that were not normally submerged have become submerged. The entire pan gasket area is submerged. 
the shifting cable area is submerged, the throttle lever is submerged, a lot of places that are not normally having to hold back a dam full of transmission fluid are doing just that. So we have leaks that occur when the car sits. Of course now, since most of our cars are used for hobby cars, they end up sitting uh, for weeks and sometimes months at a time between usage, especially during winter storage and such. So lots of complaints of uh, transmission leakage. So let's look at those and how to fix them. Remember, we're gearing this entire presentation to things that the hobbyist with only medium uh, levels of uh, mechanical capability can do. We're not going to get involved in serious uh, you know, overhaul procedures on here. That's something you need to take to, to a professional. But we're going to do the stuff that, that you can do in your garage. The first and most common place that the transmission leaks, of course, is the transmission pan gasket. Now, I have here a typically used and abused transmission pan. A little bit rusty, certainly dented up and beat up. But those things don't cause the oil leak. What happens is the gasket itself is the oil leak problem because it's the first thing that gets submerged when the uh, torque converter drains down. The usual problem with the gasket area is the original gaskets were kind of a cork material. Cork was the gasket of choice for decades, decades. But the problem with cork is after a while, you know, it's fully saturated and uh, it, it's no longer a good sealant. So what do you do? You get under there with your wrench and you start to tighten it up. And you say, hey, all these bolts are loose. They just crank down on them a little bit. And you say, all right, it's fixed. The bolts were loose. That's what was wrong with it. Well, the bolts were loose because the gasket actually got skinnier. It got compressed. It was no longer holding tension on it. So it wasn't that your torque went away. It was that your gasket kind of went away. And when you tighten up a cork gasket that was tight to begin with, and now you tighten it up again, what will certainly happen is the pan will become pulled up by every bolt hole. Now I'm going to take a straight edge here and set it against the pan, and I think you'll be able to see a lot of daylight between the flat surface of the pan and where the bolt holes now are. And that's a problem. You can imagine the kind of difficulties you're going to have when you try and seal that. So uh, you have a, several alternatives. One is there is now a reproduction pan available from Clark's. It looks just like the original, but the material of it is thicker. It's less uh, likely to uh, pull up where the bolt hole is. So you can buy a new pan if you want. There's also the cast aluminum fin pans. Uh, they have a little more fluid capacity. They got a drain plug in them. They're nicely thin. Uh, you know, they look real nice and they probably offer a little more cooling value to it. Uh, they're also pretty expensive. Or you can fix the one you got. So I'm going to show you how to fix the one you got. We're going to take an ordinary pan that's bent up like this. And I'm going to walk over to my vise here. And I'm going to use a block of steel, aluminum, whatever you got handy, about as wide as you can match the area in between the pan rails here. I'm just going to set this down on the vise. I'm going to set our pan right on the edge here where our bolt hole is. And I'm going to give it a few taps right in our area to try and smooth this out. We're going to do this for a couple of them, and then we're going to take a look at our, our pan with that straight edge again. Uh, there's another good one over here. We can see it's pulled up. So you're going to have to go over the entire uh, pan area to try and smooth out these imperfections. And if you work at it, and it's going to take a little while, 
We're still not perfect on here, I'm sure, but we're a lot better than where we started on this pan. So it's going to take a little while to uh, straighten that pan out. Uh, but with the cost of a new pan, probably over 100 bucks, I think that you could probably bang on this for a while for 100 bucks, couldn't you? So, the next thing is choice of gasket. Shall we put another cork gasket back on there so we can have the same problem? Uh, I never did. There's a couple choices for the gasket. The originals were just kind of a pure cork. They're the worst offenders. Uh, the more modern one is a cork and rubber combination. Uh, they're commonly sold. Uh, not my first choice. Again, it, it, they're better than the, the full cork ones. Uh, but they can still compress if you get a little carried away when you're tightening these up You're gonna have a problem. I would recommend that you use flat washers Underneath the bolts to help distribute the load try and get some good high quality thick washers and They should be as wide as will fit between the area where the uh, bolt goes and that will help distribute the load because the washer is obviously a much bigger diameter than just the bolt surface is so it spreads out our, our clamping force. There is also available from Clark's a couple different versions. There was originally some square, or actually there were rectangular pieces with a hole drilled in them that will fit this entire space between the rail. There was a set of them that you could buy and that does even a better job than common washers to help distribute the load. And now I see Clark's has a steel plate that mimics the exact shape of the pan gasket itself. So it's one piece that goes, you put the gasket uh, here and you put the reinforcement on the bottom and now you've totally spread out the load of the clamping force on here and that's that's that would be the way to go with a stock pan uh, I don't know how much the reinforcement is I'd have to look but uh, that's one thing you want to do is try and spread out that clamping force on here so it doesn't crunch up but as I say this is not my first choice on a gasket what I really liked and used for years was this extra thick uh, paper type gasket. I think they still are available. Uh, and there's also kind of a felt type material. It's nowhere near as compressible as the uh, original cork gaskets, but it's not quite as hard as these, these paper ones. It's kind of an in-between one. My choice would be one of these two. But to make it work properly, you need a sealer and uh, this is the product that I have used for years it's my first choice and any kind of sealer uh, for flat style gaskets it's made by Permatex it's called Permatex right stuff and uh, is this an endorsement well it's the only sealer I use because it works it's available in this small caulking gun size it's available in a little squeeze tube or they've even got a cheese whiz can type of thing so it's similar to silicone. It has that kind of consistency where you just, you know, put it on the gasket surface. And this is generally where I, the way I would do it. I coated the rails of the pan on both sides of the pan. And I made sure that I circled all the bolt holes because you can have a leak coming out of bolt hole. So I just kind of smooth that out, make sure it's around the pan. And I do the entire pan like this, set it along the entire pan. Then I would place my gasket onto the pan and I would again make those same uh, application of the product on the upper side that meets the transmission case. So we're going to have our right stuff on the bottom, right stuff on the top, put it all together with our reinforcement washers, plates, or whatever to help distribute the load on there. Tighten that thing up and let it sit. 
Yes, it says on the product, if you read it all, you can use this immediately upon application. In other words, as soon as you get back together, you can fill it up with trans fluid and you'll be all set. Well, maybe you can, but I have always had the best luck if I let it sit overnight. I make my transmission pan uh, assembly the last thing I did for the day. Let it sit overnight. You come in in the morning and it'll be nice and uh, uh, fully cured. And then if you have a little that's squished out on the sides, you can run a razor blade around the edge, just trim that right off, and it looks like it's not even there. So it won't be somebody looks, oh, you used a bunch of sealer on that. Well, if you trim it off nice, you won't be able to tell. Okay. Why do I like the right stuff so good? There's a lot of RTV products out there that uh, w will, will seal up to begin with, but I have found the right stuff holds up better than the regular RTV silicones under high temperature. High temperature contact with oil. Uh, I found on a lot of silicone stuff, that works good for a while, but after a couple of years, it kind of turns into like jello. It really doesn't have the uh, stability that the right stuff has. So that's why I use this. Okay, the next part, let's just keep going up in the transmission, things that can leak. The throttle lever. The throttle lever itself has a little o-ring on it okay and uh, they're available from Clark's you can get a set of o-rings it just slides on like any other o-ring to get this off of course the transmission pan has to be off and we have to undo a clamp that holds us in place to slide this out and replace the o-ring how do we tell if this is leaking or it's the pan that's leaking well if it's the pan leaking, the lowest part of the transmission when it sits in the car is typically the front edge. So if you see the transmission dripping from the front edge, I mean, the leak could have come from here, but it's going to follow along the pan until it gets to the lowest spot and drip off. But if you see transmission fluid dripping off the lever itself, right off the bottom corner of the lever, that is typically meaning that this o-ring is bad okay so you want to investigate that first before you take the transmission pan off glue it all up with the right stuff put it back on and two weeks later you look Jesus that thing is still leaking and you see the drip is actually coming from this the, th uh, the throttle lever uh, o-ring okay because now you're gonna have to take the pan back off and redo that when you take this out so you want to make sure this is not leaking to begin with, or just go ahead and replace it anyway. Okay, like any other O-ring, it can become hard with age and heat. So you could remove this and uh, replace the O-ring on here. How exactly do we do that? It's all right in the factory shop manual. It's just a clamp. I can show you what the clamp looks like, we think. Inside the transmission pan, and we'll take that off to show you. There's one little clamp here held on with a, a quarter 20 bolt with a 7 16 head. You loosen up the bolt, spread this a little apart with your screwdriver, and then this mechanism is gonna stay in the transmission, just pull this off. Uh, and these two parts will fall off because obviously the shaft is holding it on, but we'll show you how to put it back together. And you just slide it out, slide it back in, no problem. So that's the number one place after the pan itself. The next place is a little higher up. And that's right here where the shifting cable, and I'm going to get a cable here, slide it in. This is where your shifting cable comes from the front of the car and it goes into the case of the transmission and right where it enters the case there's an o-ring there i got a bag full of them here it's kind of a thick o-ring it just goes on the end of the cable just right on the end there and seals the transmission to the uh, the cable but my experience has been that o-ring is not particularly problematic it really doesn't give much of a problem it seals pretty good i haven't really seen them get too hard 
But what I found over the years now as these cars age is not that the O-ring leaks so much, it's the cable itself. We've got a plastic covering that actually covers the flexible cable and it shrinks right here where the metal sleeve meets the, uh, the cable. You can see that our plastic outer coating has shrunk away from the inner cable. We've got this little spot right here. Well, guess what? The transmission fluid enters the cable itself, starts to run into here, but now we have this gap between the plastic housing and the metal sleeve, and the transmission fluid drips right out of this opening. And usually, the transmission pan gasket gets blamed for it, because where does it drip? Well, if we put the cable back in here, Where's our gap? Right here at this corner. So the transmission starts to drip onto the housing here, drips down to the edge of the pan, and then goes to the lowest corner right here. So you look and say, well, that damn transmission's leaking out of that pan again, and I just sealed it up. What the heck's going on here? Well, if you look carefully, you will see that the transmission fluid is actually dripping from this little gap in the jacket of the cable. And usually the pan gasket gets blamed because that's where it's dripping from, but that's not the source. If it happens only after the car's sat a prolonged time without running, remember when that happens, the cable is now submerged too. So the transmission fluid is going to be running into the cable. And if there's any abrasion to this plastic jacket, it's going to drip out of here. The other abrasion that happens to these cables is just a little bit further up the pike here is your parking brake cable that runs from left to right uh, underneath the car. And there is a steel bracket that goes around the cable and holds the cable up to the floor pan of the car where the parking brake cable goes underneath it. Why is that there? Well, if they just let it straight in, it'd be very close to the parking brake cable and the parking brake cable would be sawing away on here, obviously damaging the outer jacket. So we've certainly had many cars over the year that somebody has done R&R uh, &R of the drivetrain, had the cable out, disconnected that clamp, threw it away, and now the cable was actually uh, rubbing on the uh, parking brake cable or the metal cable bracket itself has eventually worn through the, uh, the plastic jacket on here and now it can leak where the cable has shrunk and at any spot it's worn through. And the first common place to look at is where that cable clamp is at to hold it underneath the floor. Best way to do all this is before you delve into it. If you've got a pressure washer at home, that's great. Jack up the back of the car, set it on stands, get under there with a pressure washer and probably a face mask and just start spraying the heck out of the transmission. Clean off all this goo and accumulated dirt so you can actually see where the transmission fluid is leaking from. That's what you want to do. Clean everything off, get under there, lay on your creeper. Yeah, you're going to get dirty and splashed on but you only got to do it one time, clean it all off. It's going to make it a lot easier to work on. So once you have identified where the leak is from, and remember, it can be anywhere that the cable is abraded at. In effect, you can see on this cable, we've started to get some abrasion on it. This is probably where that cable clamp would be at. It's just about at this place. And there's some abrasion. It may not be quite all the way through, but it's working on it. So it can be most common spot where the cable ends, second most common spot here at the, uh, the little bracket, but it could be anything along in the control tunnel where let's say the cable was not properly held in by the clamps that hold it together with the wiring harness. Maybe it was rubbing on the parking brake cable. So you could have a leak four feet in front of the transmission where the cable was touching the parking brake cable and it sawed through the plastic 
on the outside. So you, your transmit, you start to get transmission fluid leaking out of the middle of the car. What the heck is that about? Well, pretty much guarantee you've got an abrasion of the cable somewhere. So, what's your fix? You can buy a new cable. They're available. Uh, they're not inexpensive. Uh, but let's say, well, yeah, find a good used cable. Well, that's great. It's a lot of work to put that cable in. You've got to take off all the tunnel covers underneath the car. You've got to take off the tow board uh, tunnel cover next to your gas pedal. And Lord help you if somebody glued the carpeting in. Oh, <laughs> you've got to, you're going to have some fun getting that out. And then if you've got a late model, you've got to pull the instrument cluster out. If you've got a forward control, you're going to have to pull the instrument cluster out. Uh, it's a big deal to change a cable. Don't, don't mistake that you're going to do that in 30 minutes. Not going to happen. You can fix this without even taking the transmission cable out of the transmission case. Very simple. I'm going to take an ordinary piece of 3 8 inch fuel line hose, 3 8 ID. I'm going to cut off a length as required to fill the damaged area. And in this case, uh, a couple inches will do. And I'm just going to slit this lengthwise. Slit it right down the middle. So now I can spread this apart if I've slit it properly. Oh, I missed a spot here. And what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to clean this area off carefully. I would typically use some uh, brake clean to spray on here and a rag to wipe it all off and then compressed air to blow this area completely dry. And next, I'm going to fill up this uh, slotted piece of hose with Permatex Right Stuff and I'm going to slip that back on here. So I'm going to actually do that for you to see how it goes. And I'm just going to spread the Permatex Right Stuff nice and flat on here and that's it. That's how you fix it. Same thing if our abrasion was further up where the parking brake cable is, I'd make a small piece of hose and I'd do exactly the same thing. So let's get out my right stuff. And I'm just going to pump some in here. And I'm just going to slip this over. I'm going to give it a little twist so it gets a chance to move the right stuff all the way around it. I'm going to slide it. Try to make sure it's compressed all the way. That's it. It's fixed. Do you have to use hose clamps on here? You could. I don't think it's going to make any difference. The right stuff's going to cure up and it'll seal that area just fine. So that's an easy fix for this. Now, as far as that clamp goes that held the transmission to the cable away from the parking brake cable, I have a suggestion if your leaking point was where the bracket holds the cable up over the parking brake cable. I would, even on a car that's not leaking yet, now normally there is a piece of rubber at that point that the factory put on the cable, okay, uh, be similar to this, and there's that steel clamp on the uh, factory installed. I would kind of ditch the steel clamp. I'd use a nylon uh, cable tie like this, and I'd just put that on there and uh, screw it up to the floor using the same bolt. And the nylon cable is not going to damage the rubber or the jacket. But the original steel one, eventually, over time, the vibration will, will cut through it. So using the nylon clamp there and our little fix on the cable, you're, that's going to fix that leak. So remember, it can happen anywhere. It, this is the first place it'll happen. It's most common. Second place, parking brake cable. But it could be somewhere up the line if that cable was uh, abraded uh, from misplacement inside the tunnel. All right, continuing on our search and, and solve for leaks. Another place you can get a leak from is the vacuum modulator. This is on the passenger side of the car. The modulator, uh, what it does, 
there's a valve inside the valve body here. It's actually not the valve body, the transmission case. And it reacts to engine vacuum. Engine vacuum is highest at idle or when you deaccelerate, and it's lowest while you're under acceleration. So what this does is change the position of this valve inside here, which regulates the uh, hydraulic pressure applied to particularly the reverse clutch and the, uh, uh, the uh, high clutch pack so that under light acceleration, the valve is positioned for low apply pressure. So when the transmission shifts from first to second, it doesn't go clunk, it has a nice easy shift and when you're in neutral and put it in drive, it eases in instead of going bang. And same with reverse. So our modulator varies the apply pressure of the transmission under uh, varying conditions. It does not, by the way, tell the transmission when to shift. If you replace this because it won't shift to drive, you just wasted your time and money because this will not tell the transmission when to shift. It simply tells it how hard to shift, okay? There is a gasket between the modulator and the case. It's a simple paper type gasket. Uh, it comes with a new modulator where you can buy it separately from Clark's. Uh, just to be sure, I wiped this clean with my uh, uh, rag and we'll wipe the modulator clean or obviously if it's a new module modulator you don't need to but I like to put a little smear of my favorite sealer my right stuff on either side of the gasket and just spin this baby back on now when it's in the car you'll notice that it's got a uh, hex head here it's actually a one inch hex head and if you look in the shop manual it'll tell you that uh, well you need this special extra skinny one inch wrench to get in there and uh, well I guess it's handy if you've got these special skinny one inch wrench but <clears throat> you can easily just use a pair of channel locks to grasp the outside rim of this don't grasp this part because you can damage it you can crush it but the outside part is uh, pretty sturdy and you can uh, grab that and tighten that guy right up or loosen it uh, it doesn't take that much it's not in with that much force but you can just uh, loosen it or tighten it with a pair of channel locks, nothing to it. The governor itself, it's only held on by one bolt here that holds the transmission to the differential. It also goes through the governor. The governor has an O-ring on it, okay? So uh, that O-ring can certainly get hard like any other O-ring. O-ring sits in the case right here. And we slide our governor on there so new o-rings are available from clark's they're available in viton as well as the regular uh, neoprene and just slips right in we tap that in like lubricate the o-ring lubricate the housing of the governor make sure it's clean and we would just slide that in tap it in lightly till our uh our holes line up for our bolt and tighten it up that's uh that's pretty much it for uh, the usual leaks. There's one other, uh, two other places that a leak can happen. And that is, this one typically will only happen while the car is running. And usually only on a late model. Now why is that? <clears throat> and that would be a leak between the transmission and the differential which will usually end up dripping out the back edge of the pan here and why would that happen because the bolts that hold the transmission to the differential loosened up how does that happen well remember on the late model Corvair our strut rods connect to the bottom of the differential case and our axles bolt into the case the axles and the strut rod are part of the rear suspension. They take all the lateral loads and even just sitting there statically, our strut rods are being pulled and the axles are being pushed. That's how the suspension works. The drivetrain is part of the suspension. So a lot of cornering forces and such, your transmission and case and the entire drivetrain is being wiggled, okay? And I found that the transmission to differential case bolts can come loose. So first thing you want to try, if you have a late model that only leaks while it's running between the trans and the diff, okay? Just make sure these bolts are tight.
because uh, you often find that they are. And if you think you're just going to get an ordinary gasket to put in there, uh, it's rather elaborate. It's got special transfer holes in it, okay, and a little clearance here for the uh, adjusting sleeve bolt, whatnot. So you can't just use an ordinary gasket. You have to get a Corvair Power Glide to differential gasket. Uh, this fits all years, and uh, that gasket would go there. So that's one place they can leak at that's not real common. The other place that's not real common and only happens when you drive down the road for a while is if you start to get transmission oil that spits out the vent on the front and will usually end up getting on the floor pan, uh, the very back uh, of the uh, floor pan, spits forward and then of course drips kind of generally off the edge of the floor pan and the edge of the transmission. That is usually caused by one of two problems. The first is that the transmission level is too high. It's overfilled. Let me give you one scenario that I've come run across in the years. Here's our uh, transmission dipstick, of course, bolts into the pan, and it's simple enough. You check the fluid level with the engine idling and the transmission warmed up. And typically, you're going to be between the full or the add mark. And as you see, it says one pint difference. That's not one quart. That's half a quart between add and full. So if you check it when the transmission's fully cold, you're going to be want to be closer to the add mark than the full mark. Because after it warms up some, you will certainly see that the uh, fluid level changes. Okay, so sometimes a vacuum modulator fails. This line here connects to engine vacuum. There's a line that runs up along the uh, transaxle and goes into the vacuum balance tube between the two carburetors. That's its vacuum source. And that's where it sees the signal to vary the line pressure according to throttle position. The diaphragm inside here can go bad and it allows transmission fluid to be sucked up into the modulator and into the engine where it gets burned. How do you know if a modulator is good or not? There's a very, very simple way to do it. Simply have your engine idling, check your transmission fluid level, see where it's at. Then unplug the line, the vacuum line, from the modulator. You can either do it here or do it up at the vacuum balance tube. Doesn't matter. Just unplug it, it uh, from the modulator. It, you don't even have to plug it. Just leave it loose and check the transmission fluid again and see if the level stayed the same. If it still sees the same level on the stick with the vacuum applied to this or not, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. However, if you have a bad modulator, if you've got it to the add mark with the vacuum line uh, connected up, then you take the vacuum line off, and all of a sudden you see it's way up here on the stick. You got a bad modulator. Where did all that extra fluid come from? Well, it was all getting sucked up into the passageways way higher than it normally is. So you just kept adding more and more transmission fluid till it finally showed up on the stick. Well, after the leak is solved, that the diaphragm isn't leaking, all that fluid went back into the pan and now you find it's greatly overfilled. That is the easiest way to check a modulator to see if the diaphragm has failed. You could also use a vacuum tool like a Mighty Vac and just put the Mighty Vac on here. You can do it even with the modulator off of the engine, you know, or off the transmission rather. Uh, just in your hand, use the Mighty Vac on there and see if it'll hold vacuum. The modulator should hold vacuum. If you pump it up and it keeps dropping to zero, the diaphragm is bad. Uh, but that assumes you have a little vacuum pump to test it with. The engine is your vacuum pump. You can just do it like I described by disconnecting the vacuum line. Simple enough. However, that was the point of that was if the level is overfilled, the transmission is going to be running. All the rotating parts are going to be getting a 
more than their share of transmission fluid because now things that are not normally submerged are submerged and eventually it's going to cause a lot of bubbles and such in the transmission fluid and it's going to start spitting out the vent okay so the first thing to check is the level the other thing I wanted to note because I did happen to me in the shop uh, more than once over the years here's two dipsticks this one is 61 to 64 and all trucks this one is the dirty one is 65 to 69 and you can see there's a bit of a difference in the length of the tube and therefore a difference in the length of the dip stick see that one is significantly different than the other so if I were to put a late model dipstick into the tube obviously it won't work however if I was to have a early model dipstick and put it into the tube of a late it fits just fine oh where do I put the transmission fluid well you put it to add, you put it to the somewhere between add and full the problem is you got the wrong dipstick you have now overfilled it by the difference in the length of the two dipsticks which is a couple of inches so uh, I have seen it happen uh, where somebody mixed up dipsticks maybe one the head was busted and they said oh here's a Corvair dipstick I'll use that well keep in mind there's two different ones early and late so use the right dipstick the other problem that can happen and this one's not so easy to solve is the converter itself has a one-way sprag in it it's a sprag clutch just like your starter drive is your starter drive locks up and spins in one direction but if the engine starts while the starter still engage it releases in the other direction so you don't overspeed the starter well the transmission has a similar device a sprag clutch in it for the various turbines inside and I've made a little tool here that I can use to uh, check that so what I've done is I've just taken a piece of exhaust pipe here and I've welded on the stator shaft on your differential that's what this one is and what's supposed to happen the stator shaft simply stays still it doesn't turn stator stationary get it it stays still while the parts inside revolve around it it's a one-way clutch if I spin it this way it's locked up if I spin it it keeps going because the inertia of the turbine keeps it going if I spin it the other way it just free wheels because it's there's nothing there, there's no drag in it the clutch is overrunning I'm not spinning the turbine inside okay if the clutch goes bad what you'll find is it spins freely like this in both directions one way it locks it up the other way disengaged okay what happens is when you get a bad sprag it'll spin freely in other in both directions and that turbine will not be turning like it should be it's kind of dragging along it's being powered by the transmission fluid going circulating inside it's it's reacting differently than it should and that drag causes heat now that you're building up heat this is a problem where you'll also get fluid spitting out the vent but only happens after the car is say highway speed you're driving along 60 70 miles an hour and after about 20 minutes or so you start to get you start to smell transmission fluid because it's dripping down here getting on the exhaust pipe smoking burning uh, this is kind of a hard one to detect it's not an extremely common problem but it does happen so if you've got a converter out you'd want to test it somehow now probably don't have a handy tool like this however you do have your differential on your car already so if you had a differential laying around any year automatic I'm going to slip this onto the differential get our shafts engaged now when it's engaged 
it's got to go all the way up where their converter is almost hitting the housing and I'm going to spin it one direction it's going to keep going because it's turning the turbine inside the other one it stops almost immediately it's harder to tell when it's all on here like this because it's got more inertia moving the entire thing as opposed to just spinning the turbine but you will feel a difference turning it one direction over the other you will notice it it's hard to visualize it like this but you can feel the difference this way it's turning freer than it is this way it takes more effort to turn it this way than the other way okay so that's how you check that without the handy tool you're using the differential as the tool so that's another place you can get a leak from at the transmission spitting it out the vent after it's fully warmed up after a highway run around town you will not notice this condition the car behaves absolutely normally it's got the same stall speed it drives perfectly normally around town and in fact drives perfectly normally on the highway but that extra drag is getting the transmission fluid hot really hot it's starting to, to aerate and that's causing it to spit oil out so that's a not a common one but I have seen it so the most common problem we get is the transmission won't shift to drive and there's typically two causes for that one is the governor and one is the e-clip inside the valve body which we're going to disassemble that and we're going to show you but first I want to show you how to diagnose which of the two it is because one of them is really easy to do the governor one bolt boom you're done the valve body e-clip uh, it's more involved okay I'm going to demonstrate how to positively check uh, to see that the e-clip is broken or not in your transmission I've rigged up our power glide demonstrator here with the cable and a shifter so I'm going to put the shifter control into low and you'll see the lever move up that's dry that's low and with the rods disconnected on the side here the motor off I want you to feel how the lever moves up not into spring detent okay but in the normal place between the bottom and uh, moving the throttle lever it'll move easily you'll feel a little bit of spring tension next I want you to start the engine up obviously with the parking brake on and then put the transmission selector back into low and with the rod to the carburetor disconnected I want you to feel how it is to move this you will find it is much harder to move this lever up and down the same distance than it was before it's because the clip is broken and the valve is being pushed backwards it's wanting to push the lever down and it's going to cause extra pressure for you to push it up if that happens only when the transmission selector is in low and the engine running the clip is positively broken Okay. but if the lever just goes normally when you put it in low it's going to go the, the hole here is going to go somewhat above the edge of the pan but otherwise it's still going to be free motion okay that's not the problem it's not the e-clip next thing to look at is the governor itself as we've mentioned before one bolt between the uh, transmission and differential here you take that bolt out and you can pull your governor out and our governor as I explained earlier is a pretty simple device it's just got a couple of fly weights in here that allow the little valve inside here to move back and forth it's just a slide valve let me find my screwdriver what did I do with it I just had it here it is so inside our governor has the fly weights and this little valve inside here we can see it move and as I move it back and forth it opens up a passageway here I move it the other way it's not moving very far it's a small amount of distance but all we're doing is allowing the fluid to go from one side into the other side okay so first thing you want to do when you pull the governor out make sure this is free make sure it moves okay if it's not free that's the problem it's stuck in one place so it could be a little piece of dirt or a little shaving or something in there try and free it up okay 
The other problem could be, and I have seen this, is if I take the governor out and the gear looks like this one. Guess what happened? The gear got eaten up. Well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to slip just another uh, governor in there and hope for the best? Well, I can pretty much guarantee the reason that one got chewed up like this is because the gear that turns it on the end of the differential pinion shaft here and this gear does come off, it does slide right off of here if we wanted to take it off this gear got rusty I've seen this happen on cars that have been sitting a long period of time and maybe the transmission inside here had some moisture well the moisture, where's the moisture going to go? it's going to rise to the top so anything that's up on top is going to get rusty and the particular car this was in there was about a half inch of this gear that was rusty and what happened over time it was acting like sandpaper on the gear every time it turns around working on the nylon gear working on the nylon gear until finally the teeth wore off the nylon gear and it stopped turning if the governor doesn't turn it doesn't know that the car is moving it won't shift so those are the two likely suspects for not shifting to drive the governor malfunction or not turning or the e-clip inside and we've already told you how to check for the e-clip so with the governor out of the way let's get a valve body apart and show you where the e-clip is okay after we've determined externally that our e-clip is likely the fault you know with our little test with the lever at the engine running this is our extension of our throttle uh, valve here connected to the linkage so you can see that as we push it down we're pushing this valve in and the bottom part here that's our detent where we get that extra springiness when that hits that that's our kick down to get it uh, downshift into low and if we put the lever in low with a defective e-ring this pushes back on the uh, the throttle lever and it will cause uh, cause uh, extra pressure on here that normally isn't there normally this freely moves around but this kicks it with extra pressure when it's defective so we are going to remove the valve body now keep in mind remember I told you how the torque converter drains down when the engine's not running that's what's going to happen only accelerated 10 times when we take this valve body off of here so if the transmission holds three quarts of oil I guarantee it will leak five quarts of oil out when you take this apart so be prepared with the pan underneath there and uh, also that it's probably going to run down your arm and everything else so just be prepared for that so first thing off after the trans pan itself is the filter if you've got the 60 to 63 variety you're going to have to remove the screw it's usually believe it or not a, a flathead screw on here and you pop off the the screen itself and sometimes you've got to pry it off a little bit if the o-ring's not so fresh and keep in mind people say oh i need to get a filter for that transmission this is just a screen there is no filtering media in here there's no need to buy another one of these you simply rinse it out in whatever cleaner you have uh, or spray it with some brake cleaner or something that's all there is to it it's simply a screen it is not a filter per se once the screen is out of the way we've got a variety of bolts here they're 5 16 18 all of them have the same size head they're all half inch if you see anything with a different size in it other than half inch don't bother with it here's our one for our throttle lever that's 7 16 don't don't bother touching it it's only our half inch ones we're going to take off when we do that I would take all of them off except one leave one on there because this is weighs a couple pounds and if you're not prepared for that you take that last one off this is going to fall out and into your drain bucket and bloosh there's going to be a big mess for you to clean up so when you get down to that last bolt make sure you're holding this valve body 
and take off that last bolt, let it come off a little bit because when you first take it off, you're going to get a lot of transmission fluid coming out of the passageways inside of here. It's really going to come out quite quickly. So once that kind of stops draining, it's never going to stop dripping, not for at least a year. <laughs> Keep dripping some, but the first main gusher, let it settle into the pan and then the valve body can come out. If you have a 64 or later transmission, there's one more part in here that will come out when the valve body comes out. And that's this little guy here. It's a downshift timing valve. It's used only on the 64 and later transmissions. It goes into a cavity in the main body of the transmission. It only fits in one place, so you don't have to worry about it or a billion little check balls falling out. This is the only thing that'll come out, 64 and later. When it's time to put it back in, this part with the little uh, triangle faces downward, okay? And if you put a little bit of grease around the perimeter, perimeter of this, you can slide it back into its hole, it'll stay there, and you put it all back together. But keep in mind, that will probably fall out on a 64 and later. So once the valve body itself is out of the transmission, you see the valve body is really made of two pieces. This is the main piece here. This is a secondary piece, small and big. Our culprit is in this part here where our throttle valve is, okay? So to take this apart, it's very simple. It's only held together with four screws and we really don't need to even take the little one off. But it'd be handy if you had this clutch head. Ever hear of a clutch head before? It's kind of an oddball type of screw head. I've got a bigger one here so you can see it. If any of you ramp side owners are out there, you have probably cussed and cursed these because they use clutch head screws to hold the ramp gate on and several of the body panels. Uh, these clutch head screws kind of went out of favor uh, a long time ago, but you do find a number of clutch heads in, in oddball places on 60 and 61 models, the turn signal bowl, uh, some of the, uh, the rear grill attaching screws on 60s. Uh, it's used in some oddball places. But you can still buy some clutch head screwdrivers, and I got this years ago. You can see that uh, this wasn't a recent purchase. So I'm going to use one of my clutch heads here to take out the two screws that hold the main valve body part on. And keep in mind, <coughs> There's a spring-loaded section here between the two. So as I take out the second bolt, <clears throat> this is going to try and push off. So I'm just going to be prepared for that. Now this is a valve body I have not taken apart before. So what will we find in here? We don't know. And it may possibly be a little bit stuck. There is two gaskets involved in this assembly. One of them is between the case and the valve body, and then another one between the bigger valve body and this separator plate. So if we were going to contemplate disassembling a valve body, I would want to have two new gaskets on hand. They are available from Clark's. Uh, it's just good practice, because if one of them tears, uh, you are you're not going to make a gasket like this. I can guarantee you that. So our plate came apart. This is a valve body that's been sitting around and uh, a little bit of rust on there, but doesn't look uh, too bad. And in this case, uh, looks like our valve body gasket stayed intact. So if we were in a pinch, we could probably reuse that, but I would never want to take that is a uh, probability that I'd have to be able to use it. And in order to see what we need to see, we're going to have to get this gasket off of here. And as I expected, uh, getting it off in one piece, uh, maybe not so much, huh? Okay. So the gasket's got to come off. In this case, our 
our lever here, our throttle, there we go, we, this was kind of jammed up from sitting around a long time. There's our normal valve inside. Our E-clip, now remember, this is on our driver's side of the car by the valve body, and here's our throttle valve. It's the second one right here. So the third passageway from the front, one, two, three, and here is our E-clip. Now, what's an E-clip in case you don't know? This is a big version of an E-clip, okay? It just uh, pops over a shaft and holds that shaft from moving outside of its boundary. Now, the actual one that fits on this is a tiny little E-clip, okay? The size is noted in our tech guide, and I'll look that up for you in a moment. But here's where it goes in this little passageway, our third passageway from the uh, front of the car, and it's got a little slot on the valve it pops onto. And that prevents this valve from moving further than that distance. This valve will move back and forth uh, and tell it when to shift. If that clip falls off, the oil pressure pushes this entire shaft backwards and the oil pressure holds it there. That's why it changes all of a sudden the pressure on here and it will not let the transmission shift to dry because it's being told to stay in low because the valve itself is in the wrong position. So if you find a broken E-clip, what you really have to do is look in all the passages and in the oil pan when you took it off because that clip went somewhere, it just didn't disappear. It's going to be somewhere in the valve body and it probably broke in two pieces, so you're going to find both pieces. Take a look and make sure they're no longer in the valve body. If you do find a broken E-clip, now you'd also want to take off the secondary part and make sure it didn't get in there. The secondary part has got only, a, it's got a couple other things. It's got two spring-loaded valves in it, okay, and one big check ball. The check ball can only go one place. We'll just take it off, just so you get a, a quick view of it, what's inside this thing. Again, using my clutch head screwdriver, I'm just going to zip off this part of the valve body. So this is the smaller part of our valve body. And inside, we'll find our check ball here. The check ball can only fit in this one location. And we've got two little valves here, spring-loaded. Make sure you pay attention to which one goes where, because they are different. There is no gasket between this and the separator plate. Okay, so we could just screw this one back together. And let's see if I get this right. Here we go. We would clean this off, of course, before we put it back together with our two screws. And then, once we have put our new clip in here, got off all the old gasket pieces, cleaned everything up on both sides of the separator plate, we would have our new gaskets on hand, remember? <clears throat> You're not going to make one of these at home. All these passageways are important. So there's two of them. One of them, the small one, goes over the larger valve body, and the other one goes between the entire assembly and the case of the transmission. So you, if you're going to tackle this job, you'd want to buy those two gaskets from Clark's ahead of time so you got them. Because if you tear it, uh, you are not going to find these gaskets. Uh, they're just too much of a specialty item. Uh, so have those to start with. And reassembly is as simple as reinstalling uh, uh, the little downshift timing valve. Make sure it's in place if it's a 64 later before you put it all together and then find out, oh, what's this? Take it all back apart. And when you put the transmission valve body back in place, here is the manual lever. The manual lever is the one that connects to the rindle on the dash, your dash selector. As you put the valve body up in place, make sure that the manual valve here is lined up with 
this lever. Okay, let it slide into that hole as you put it together because if this is outside of the valve body uh, lever here, if it's hanging here, you cannot slide that back in there without taking this shaft off. Okay, if one were to take the shaft out of here, say to replace that O-ring on the, the uh, throttle valve, you loosen that 7 16 hole, spread the, this apart, and pull this off. You're going to have the few pieces that we showed you before. on our throttle lever. That's going to be our selector right here and the clamp. Okay, that's the assembly that you're going to find underneath there. Put those all back together, tighten them to the torque as specified in the factory shop manual. Put your filter back on, then reinstall your pan gasket as we've covered before fill it with transmission fluid and you should be shifting fine. Those are the two most common problems. I'll touch on a couple others that could happen, but those are something you're not going to be able to fix in your home garage. Now one question I got all the time in the shop was somebody had the transmission out, the drivetrain out, shift cable out, whatever. They put it all back together and then they called me in a panic, oh, my transmission's only got drive, what do I do? I can't get it to back up, it won't go neutral. Well, they didn't put in the shifting cable into the transmission the correct way. It doesn't just bolt in. If you simply slide the transmission cable in and bolt it up, I guarantee you, you will have only forward speed. Why? Inside here, we talked about the this is our manual valve here. It's connected to the shift cable and it selects forward, reverse, neutral, drive. And the way that works is you've got this little ball on the end of the shift cable. And when you put it together, what's supposed to happen is you line up this uh, lever here with the ball. And as you push it forward, it slips it into uh, the cable here and retains it. So normally it's in the middle of this and uh, when you move the cable in and out it selects the correct range. If you don't have this lever in the right range what happens is you try and push the ball in it doesn't go in the slot it goes on the side of it and pushes it all the way into the low position and there's nothing that pulls it back the ball just is sliding it can only push it forward into low range. So that's a common problem. How do I get this in correctly? We're going to try and show you this. Uh, it's a little bit tricky here. Shells, if you would help us. We're going to have our, our uh, light right about here. So as per the shop manual instructions, with the linkage all disconnected, we're going to rotate our throttle lever fully counterclockwise and you see what this did it pushed our uh, our lever here all the way in line with the hole in the uh, case where the ball comes in so I'm just going to use a screwdriver and you can see my screwdriver slipping into the very top of this lever and once it's in place then I can install my bolt on the outside of the cable. So I'm just going to slide the cable itself in place here so you can see how that works. Now, there's our ball. It's in there. I pushed it all the way into the position where I can bolt it up. Okay. Now, to double check this, you can do one of two things. Once the bolt is in place, Put the transmission selector into dry position and as you do that the cable will extend out and move the lever to where the hole in this is just above the level of the pan. Then what I want you to try and do is put the shift lever into the low position and on the dashboard if the lever goes all the way to the bottom of low easily the ball is inside where it belongs and you're set to go. If 
the lever does not want to go all the way to the bottom of low, do not force it because what's happened is the ball is on the outside of the lever. It's not on the inner slot and if you try and put it in all the way in low, it won't go all the way down because it's run out of room. Yep. So don't force the cable into the low position on the dashboard. If it goes all the way to the bottom of low range, it's properly hooked up with the ball inside of the slot where it should be. If you don't have it in the right way, the ball's on the outside, you can't get the lever to move all the way into low. Do not force the lever to the bottom of low. It should just click in normally. So if it clicks all the way normally to the bottom of low, your cable is installed the correct way. Let me turn this so I get it. That's it. It's in the slot the correct way, and we're good to go. You can bolt everything back up. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate here with our demonstrator transmission and a shifting cable how to install the uh, shifter cable into the housing properly. This is another way to check it. Now, lever all the way counterclockwise. Transmission selector, which I have uh, one on the end of the cable here, in drive. As we install it, our ball should go into the slot of the lever valve. I'm going to push it into place. Okay, And when I do so, you saw the lever moved up and the hole for the accelerator linkage is just about even with the bottom of the pan here. That's the normal position for this. If I had done it incorrectly, that's correct right now, in drive, just even with the bottom of the pan. If I had done this wrong, say I didn't have the lever all the way down, when I push the cable into the transmission, it's going to be higher than the pan. It's because the ball isn't in the slot. It's pushing against it, not in it. So you see that the, the hole is above the level of the pan. When it's in correctly, it will be just below the level of the pan. The manual valve here, which is the one that actually moves back and forth when we put the shift lever selection, is an adjustment on here. If you simply remove the cable and put it back to the same transmission, you shouldn't have to mess with this. But let's say you replace the cable. Okay, now your shift lever doesn't quite line up like reverse is just barely off of neutral or drive is way down at the bottom of drive. That means the adjustment between the cable and this valve is off. There is a place to adjust it on your manual valve. This small screw here, if we loosen it, this is slotted. So we have some motion between the two. If we loosen this we can change the relationship of this pin to the actual lever. So where do we adjust it? As per our shot manual, we're going to adjust the position of this valve, which is inside the valve body, to the very first hole inside the valve body towards the front of the car. I think you can see it all there, that if I move this manually, now we've covered the entire slot. Now we're back too far in the bore. What I want is the end of the valve to be even, to be even with the slot. If you had one of these tools, it's pretty easy. You push the tool into the hole, pull it back against the forward, this is towards the front of the car, forward side of the slot, and then push the lever in and we would adjust this so that when it's in the drive position, the lever is holding the tool in place. You can make one of these. It's pretty simple. It doesn't have to be steel. You can use a wooden dowel pin with like a, uh, a U-joint needle bearing just screwed into it. The distance between the end of the tool right here and the forward side of the pin is going to be about 0.2. We're going to be pretty close. We're on a little bit of an angle here. We're right about 0.2 on there. So that's 0.2 or 13 64ths. 
But you remember, you don't need the tool. Simply line up with it in drive. The end of the flat side of the valve should be lined up exactly with the start of that slot, the very first slot in the valve body. If you line those up in drive, you'll be all set. You won't need the tool. Now, as I say, if you're putting the same cable back into the same transmission, you shouldn't have to bother with the manual adjustment. But if you put a different cable in or a different transmission, or you've rerouted the cable for whatever reason, make sure you put it in the factory way it was installed. Because if you reroute it, change how it goes, it will change the effective length of that cable. And you may end up having to do this to make this, the range on the dashboard match what the transmission does. Another adjustment that sometimes has to be made, it's not something that's done frequently, but that's the low band, okay? The low band adjustment on here actually presets the amount of tension that the transmission will have in low range. It's very simple adjustment, maybe not so easy to get to. On a 60 model, you know, there's no heater ducting above the uh, uh, transmission. It's just that, that uh, storage area behind the back seat. And if you take up the, the matting that's in there, you'll find a uh, rubber plug in the rear deck and you pop out that rubber plug and you can get right to this. Well, that's the only year you can do that. Uh, everything else is in the way on all the other years, so you're gonna have to uh, get in here. And the shop manual says you need to drop down the front of the transmission to get access. Well, you don't really. What you're gonna need is a three quarter uh, box wrench like this, and you're gonna have to uh, probably angle it down so you can get in here. There's a lot of stuff going on. You got your starter, everything else. But uh, you get this on here and you can bust the, uh, the lock nut loose. Now here's an important thing. When we loosen this, sometimes the screw will want to come out with it. Do not, I repeat, do not allow the screw to unscrew from the transmission as you take off the nut. Well, Lair, why not? Well, I'll show you why not. Let me get the actual apply strut. This is what's inside the transmission. It's got a little pointed uh, piece on the end of this screw. And if we were to unscrew this all the way, our apply strut might go boink like that. And now when we try and screw it back in, our screw may be here and not in there where it needs to be. So do not unscrew this all the way. Try and keep it where it was so that the bottom of the adjustment stays in the strut where it needs to be. So once we have our nut off, I'm gonna take just a 5 16 uh, opening and I'm gonna snug this up. The spec is, I believe, 40 inch pounds. It's in the shop manual but you're not gonna be able to get a torque wrench handily in here, there's too much going on. And so what I do is I just make it snug, okay? 40 inch pounds is not very much. Just make it snug. Now you're gonna back it off four turns. So, one, two, three, four. Now we're gonna put the nut back on and of course, as we put it back on, we're going to try and keep our adjustment from turning. Now I'm going to use our three quarters to tighten it up. That's it. A low band adjustment. Very simple, easy to do. When would you adjust the low band? You'd adjust the low band if the transmission slips, uh, particularly uh, from acceleration, from a low speed standing start, the trans will slip. You'll, it'll actually make a funny sound uh, as it slips. That's a good time to, to uh, check the low band adjustment. If you find that after adjusting it, there's hardly any thread showing, that low band, the, the friction material on it is getting pretty worn out. Okay, normally you'd see several threads past the nut uh, when the low band is properly adjusted. If the, if the threads are actually below the nut, if it doesn't slip, it would be amazing, okay, because your friction material is pretty well gone. Remember, the other thing that coincides with it could be the transmission modulator because it is changing the pressure according to the load. Some modulators uh, 
are, are not correct, ones that are uh, not specific to Corvairs, and uh, the pressures could be wrong in it. If, uh, if your transmission didn't start to slip until after you changed a modulator, uh, you probably have one of the modulators that has improper spring tension inside of it and therefore is changing the fluid pressure incorrectly. I've seen some modulators, the early Chevy 2, uh, you know, small power glide, uh, has a very similar modulator except the hole inside where the valve goes is a different size. So what some uh, companies have done is simply bore that hole bigger to fit the Corvair valve, but it doesn't that didn't compensate for the change in the spring pressure. So if you have a situation where the modulator has recently been changed and the transmission started to slip, before you do anything else, try a different modulator, one that's known to be good, a good original used one, or a period aftermarket one, say like one from Ford Warner or ATP or any of the other co many companies that made aftermarket replacement modulators back in the day. I'd be a little concerned about some of the newer reproduction ones that uh, have had uh, modifications made from the Chevy 2 one because I have had instances where those slipped and caused transmission to slip and uh, it was only the modulator that was the problem. All right, a couple more things. Uh, these are things that you're probably not going to do in your home garage. Basically, anything to do re with reverse on the car is more than you're going to do in your home garage because reverse is at this end of the transmission. In other words, at the differential end, which means it's the first part into the case when it's reassembled and also means it's the last part out and it gets real involved when you get that deep into it. This is, a, this is a transmission job if it's a reverse problem. Most common is the transmission won't back up when the car is cold. You put it in reverse and you wait and you wait and you wait and nothing happens and finally it'll start to back up. Or uh, it could be exactly the opposite in that the car backs up okay when it's cold but when it's hot it engages really slowly and slips. If it doesn't back up when it's cold, it usually means the lip seal, the rubber seal in there is hard. And when you put it in reverse, the lip seal is supposed to flop into place and seal it to allow the pressure to build up and engage reverse. Uh, what happens when that seal is cold, the oil's just going around it and it's not flopping into place. After everything warms up, the seal gets pliable enough that it will go in place and the trans will work fine when it's hot. That's, that's way in the transmission. The other scenario is when it backs up fine cold, but not when it's hot, it usually means the apply piston for reverse has got cracks in it. That's a known problem on high mileage transmissions. It gets cracks and then the oil is going through the cracks instead of applying the uh, reverse clutches. And that's another transmission out of the car repair. So those are two things you're not gonna fix readily. The second, we talk about uh, when the clutches for drive, in other words, second gear apply. Again, we could have a problem, same as the reverse, is the transmission won't shift into drive when it's cold. And that is the same sort of scenario. The lip seal on the drive clutches is hard. Yeah, it's not flopping into place to seal the drive clutch from engaging the, the, the clutches. And after the transmission's warmed up, then it shifts okay, rest of the day. And uh, every morning when it's cold, and the colder it is, the worse the problem is. Again, that's the, the high clutch seals are bad and need to be replaced. So those are the common type of shifting problems that, that you might encounter. It's a, it's a very durable transmission, the power glide, but of course, we are well beyond the service life. Chevrolet didn't expect them to be driving 10 years after they were sold, let alone 60 years after they were sold. So they've far uh, done a fine job for us. I had a couple of questions when we did our original presentation. One was what type of transmission fluid to use? Dexron, Mercon is the common stuff that's available. I don't have a preference for the, for the type of fluid. Uh, the brand of it. Uh, if you want to use a synthetic fluid, that's fine. Uh, it costs more money, but it's probably better at heat dissipation. Uh, obviously, you want to make sure your trans is good and sealed up, uh, no leakage, uh, uh, before you start buying more expensive fluid for it. But uh, 
I don't have any preference as well. It's a modern uh, Mercron uh, Dextron. Uh, if you find some old type A stuff, like say, man, that stuff's ancient. Don't use that stuff. That uh, it, it's nowhere near the durability of the, of the modern transmission fluid. Okay, there, there's a lot of really special transmission fluid for certain automatics. Stay away from that. The regular stuff that's Dextron Mercon, probably Dextron Mercon 3 uh, will work fine, commonly available. Uh, another uh, question we had was how about the uh, high stall speed torque converter that, that's available from Clark's? Is there any advantage to that? Stall speed means when you're at a stop, and you stand on the gas pedal, the engine will go to a certain RPM, and that's the stall speed. That's as much as the engine can, can build up its RPM before the car actually launches away. And with the high stall speed, there's more slippage in it, so the RPM that it will gain when the car is standing still is higher, which means the engine is capable of higher horsepower at a higher RPM. Uh, a high stall speed converter will certainly give the car a better performance from a standstill. It'll be much snappier from a standstill than a, uh, the standard original one. Um, after probably about 25 miles an hour in low, uh, there's no more difference really because the engine will get to a certain speed and the torque converter will actually, the torque converter gets to a certain speed that there is no more slippage anymore. It's still kind of a close to a one-to-one -one ratio just like uh, the regular converter would be. So in that from standstill to 25-ish or so, it will make a notable difference in the acceleration. The downside to that converter is it generates heat. All that slippage makes more heat. And uh, if you were uh, in normal driving, that's probably not an issue. If you were had some special application like a uh, a green briar and you were pulling a little trailer with it, I don't know that I would recommend that because now you're probably at a, at a range where you're going to be generating, there's going to be a lot more slippage going on than the standard converter. You're going to be making a lot more heat. Uh, hopefully you've got that forward control transmission cooler in there like it's supposed to be to help dissipate some of that heat. Uh, and of course your mileage is going to be uh, affected by that because your engine's turning more RPM. As I say, over a certain RPM, there is no more difference. If you're driving down the road at 70 miles an hour, it makes no difference because you're already above the stall speed. Same, same performance, but at low speeds, it'll make a difference. One other question we had during our original session was, how high a MPH can you stay in low range? That's uh, that's really not a transmission limitation, that's really an engine limitation. You can keep this transmission lever in low and keep your foot on the floor until basically the engine blows up. The transmission's not gonna blow up, but the engine might. So it, it's not a limitation of the power glide itself. Now, uh, the way the transmission governor uh, works, if you're going along at say 70 miles an hour and you put the shift lever in low, the transmission will undoubtedly stay in drive until your vehicle speed reduces down low enough that it can engage uh, the low band. And typically that's going to be under 50 miles an hour. Now, if you also put it in low and floored it at the same time where you get into the downshift detent, it might go into low at a pretty high speed. Uh, that speed's not really going to hurt the transmission, but uh, you're, you're going to fling your fan belt off <laughs> if you do that. And you could damage the engine uh, by over-revving it. So it, how, f how many miles an hour in low? Normally fully set up with standard size tires at full throttle in drive, the shift point from low to drive is going to happen somewhere between probably uh, 49 to 55 miles an hour, depending upon the, tire, the, the final drive ratio, the differential ratio you have. So that's the normal uh, fastest you would go in low uh, for standard size tires and ranges. But it won't, if you want to keep it in there longer, you can, but you're not going any faster. You're beyond the highest horsepower of the engine. The engines peak out typically between 4,400 and 4,800. If you're keeping it in low above that speed, all you're doing is making a lot more noise. You're not going faster. You'd be better off if you shifted to drive so you get back into the torque range. 
So that pretty much concludes our, our power glide uh, session for today. Like I said, it was geared to stuff that I think you as the Corvair enthusiast with with modest mechanical skills can tackle. You know, the none of these one problems is particularly bad uh, to do. The valve body's a little messy. It's not real hard, but it's just a messy operation. But uh, you know, the number of people that, that work on these old transmissions is uh, not too many of them around anymore. And you can do a lot of this stuff on the power glide yourself. It's a very simple unit. Uh, when you take off the valve body, you know, 10 check balls and springs don't go flying out all over the place. It's, it's not going to hurt your brain when you work on this. Uh, got to have your shop manual, got to have your tech guide, got to have beginner's manual so you have a some reference material. Don't go into this blind. Make sure you get your gaskets that you're going to need ahead of time so you got your stuff there and uh, you'll be in pretty good shape. I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, we're going to do some more in the future on other uh, Corvair topics and especially like to thank my cameraman who brought down all his equipment today, John Myers, and my wife Shelly who helped in the production of both the original and this one today. So thanks much from uh, Larry Claypool and our entourage. Also wanted to make a special thanks to Jeanette Alberti, our course of membership chair, for getting the initial idea of our tech, our course of uh, workbench sessions going for us. Uh, Jeanette was instrumental in that, that whole operation and getting it on our, our YouTube channel. So make sure you tune in on there and watch for our latest video.